I yeah, I actually I found one here. Oh, perfect. Okay. It was abandoned. I'd like to welcome everybody to our electronic uh, Board of Health meeting. Uh, due to COVID-19 pandemic, the Board of Health is practicing physical distancing. And the majority of our counselors are participating electronically. Um, Councillor Clark and myself are the two that are present in the council chamber. Um, so I will call this um, Board of Health meeting to uh, order, and I would consider a motion to reconvene in open session. That has been moved by Councillor Erb and Councillor Galloway. I would ask everybody to please use their icon buttons to show if you are in favor of that motion. That is carried. Thank you, colleagues. Um, we have a memo to uh, Council about the COVID-19 wave one response. And Mr. Lochner, do you want to speak to this? Yes, thanks, Madam Chair. Um, so I've been asked, and Dr. Wong has been asked as well, what's the difference between wave one and wave two? Um, so we thought we'd put together um, a little bit of a, of a summary of what we did in wave one, and then I'll talk a little bit more about, uh, about wave two. So as we sit at our uh, community pandemic control table, as we work with partners from uh, uh, area municipalities to utilities to school boards and so on. Um, the good news is a lot of the things that we wrestled with back in March and April and May are in place now. Um, so kudos to all our partners in the community who, who worked really hard um, in a reactive mode to put things in place. And in my briefing note, you see uh, some of those things. The, the region itself, um, this council passed uh, a mass bylaw we're just learning that that's uh, now being mandated by the province, uh, province-wide. So ahead of the game here, um, temporary accommodations were put in place um, between us and area municipalities and our partners to protect the homeless, um, continue to find uh, ways to keep our essential services going. So again, coming here, you would have thought that someone coming from health would have thought about our water services, but to see that we didn't have any outbreaks um, in things like water services and transportation and community services and so on is a testament to uh, all, all of the municipalities and our staff. Um, and then the community at large, um, if we think of the iron ring that we talked about that we didn't have in the spring around our long-term care homes. So not completely safe, they're not risk-free, um, but a lot of work has been done to keep COVID out of the long-term care homes and try to avoid the disaster that we went through in the spring and summer. Uh, most recently, even the, uh, you know, the Ezra Avenue and the, the fact that uh, the community responded, our students responded. So a lot of things are different and in place that we didn't have if we think back six months ago. In terms of wave two, um, what's different? Um, in wave one, schools were closed. We didn't have to worry about how we're gonna manage that. In wave one, a lot of our business is closed. And I'm not saying that's a good thing, but again, didn't have to manage that. People out and about didn't have to manage that. People were back in their homes for the most part. Um, and then I think a, a significant piece from the health system, we shut down surgeries. And again, that wasn't a good thing. We, su we shut down um, a lot of outpatient clinics and so on. And now we have that huge backlog. So that backlog is being addressed. And that means nurses and doctors and other staff in, in the healthcare sector aren't available for things like testing aren't available for things like help us in the long-term care homes. Or if they are, they're stretched because they're exhausted. So this, um, as we step back and look at the, uh, the goal in front of us to keep people safe, to keep the economy running, um, to keep schools open, um, is a much more difficult task in my view. And um, kudos to, to Dr. Wong and her colleagues for every day, not only dealing with that, but also the changing evidence. Um, and the evidence is changing constantly. And uh, with that, um, I, I think Dr. Wong probably won't say this, but I will, um, in dealing with the um, influence that uh, decision makers, particularly on the political side of the House in Toronto, have to face with um, people lobbying for um, all sorts of different things that aren't necessarily grounded in science and then medical officers and our, our healthcare folks having to respond to that, rules or approaches that maybe are influenced from 
people outside that, uh, that, that science realm. So that's a lot to ask for. Um, and, and, and kudos again to, to Dr. Wong and our colleagues across the province for being as proactive as possible. So I wanted to give that context. I thought it was important for the board um, and council to understand that wave two is significantly different, but um, we can take some comfort that we don't have to deal with all those issues that we dealt with in wave one. I can't imagine um, doing this with all of those issues that we faced in wave one also facing us today. So I wanna give a shout out to, um, to, to this council, to staff, um, to the area municipalities, to their, their councils and their staff, um, and our partners who work so hard um, to, to bring us to this point. Um, and, uh, and I think they deserve a lot of credit for bringing us to where we are today. So gonna be a rough uh, number of months ahead, but uh, again, great partnership. This, this group and the Community Pandemic Control Group does, does great work and I'm confident that we're gonna get through this um, better than had we not have the, had those partnerships. So with that, Madam Chair, happy to take questions or, or turn it back to you. Okay, um, I, I see uh, Councillor Foxton has her hand up. Councillor Councilor Foxton, do you have a question or a comment? I do, I need help. <laughs> God, I need help. Okay, I have a situation where um, our staff has allowed for a craft show to happen this Saturday. They said it meet, they're meeting all the COVID-19 mandate and things. I'm not comfortable with it, but they said under legislation it's allowed. And the person responded back to our staff saying, I personally don't understand this. The government has announced we need to only gather with people within our families that we live with. How is this safe? And she's talking about the craft show. I can't see my nephews, but I can gather at a market. My friends that live in air can't come to the NDCC, our complex, to watch their child play hockey, but they can come inside to shop at a market. This doesn't add up. But on answer to this, I want to read my CAO's response. I can find it here, if you, if you allow me, please. Um, and the CEO goes to, uh, to respond, I would like to correct one statement you made in your email below. It's about the spectators, and he clarifies that for her. And he goes, the various restrictions and guidance notes that are provided by the province are full of contradictions and inconsistencies. That said, we are applying the standards as published in the provincial regulations, and we have had each user group, sports, leisure, commercial, et cetera, that usually utilize our facilities, prepare a COVID safety plan, and submit the same as part of their contract. On the same note, I just got a text from another individual saying, why can I go and do this, and I can't, but I can't go and, you know, my mother. And, and it's, so these contradictions are what we have to explain to the public. And if anyone can help me, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm going to look to Dr. Wong because I'm sure she can explain all of this with great clarity. Yeah, so so you're, um, uh, it's correct that, um, you know, this afternoon, uh, the provincial government put out recommendations that um, people should uh, limit uh, contact um, uh, with people outside of their immediate household, um, but what they what they mean by that is close contact. Uh, so you know, contact where you don't have to physically distance uh, and wear a mask, because the the next part of their guidance says with people outside of your household you know, um, you should physically distance and, and mask. So, uh, you know, businesses and, and schools are, are still opened uh, with the understanding that there'll be measures taken at these various places for people to be able to maintain distancing and masking. So really the sticking to your household um, uh, members uh, is in relation to doing it, um, you know, without any precautions. Councillor Fox. Great answer. I'm typing it away. Great answer <laughs> to respond to her. It was a great answer, Dr. Wang, and I wish you would also publicize that because it makes people understand that in certain situations we have to react one way, in certain other situations we can be like this. Thank you so much for that. I'm typing away. 
Any further questions or comments of Dr. Wong? Yeah. Dr. Wong, do you want to add some comments to Mr. Lochner about phase one and going into phase two? Yeah, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd just like to add a, a, a few updates for the, for the board. Uh, first, I just wanted to update them on the school nurses um, initiative. Um, and then I was uh, just going to say a few things about uh, the COVID status uh, in, in, in our region. Um, so uh, with respect to um, uh, school nurses, uh, Region of Waterloo Public Health has hired 25 nurses uh, to provide support to schools. Uh, the nurses are currently being trained and oriented uh, to their roles and will receive their school assignments early next week. Uh, so each nurse will provide support to approximately 12 schools, uh, including those in the public Catholic, English and French school boards, uh, private and parochial schools. And I'm just going to name a few examples of the ways in which these uh, newly hired nurses will support schools going forward. So they will um, help manage contact tracing and daily monitoring of uh, school contacts of positive cases, provide guidance and recommendations to schools on outbreak measures, uh, provide recommendations on, you know, as um, measures such as cohort isolation and full or partial dismissal uh, for, for cases in schools should, should there be a need uh, to, to do that and um, conduct a virtual or on-site visits as needed as part of outbreak uh, uh, investigation and work with the school board to coordinate reporting of positive cases and outbreaks uh, by the school board and public health. So just wanted uh, to keep you posted uh, that this was, um, you know, um, happening and, and we're, we're, we're very happy to uh, welcome our new nurses. Um, I also wanted to provide an update on the COVID status um, uh, in Waterloo region. So as of this morning, uh, there are 144 active cases. So, you know, relatively stable right now. Um, we're a little bit lower than yesterday, but that can fluctuate and it can go up a little bit uh, as well. Um, a total of 135,000 tests uh, have been performed in the Waterloo region. That's a, that's a good number. And um, there are now um, two people that are currently hospitalized. So, um, you know, overall, uh, as you may have seen, um, in, in terms of uh, the, our daily numbers, um, our, our, our situation is, is not like that in Toronto, Ottawa, or Peel. Um, but I have to say, you know, the, the province overall is in a is in a second wave. Uh, we a couple of weeks ago were also accelerating in terms of our number of new cases. Um, this could happen very quickly again. Um, we cannot present. Uh, we are in a precarious state. Um, uh, you know, yesterday uh, the lab network reported that over eighty two thousand tests are still in process. So we must not let up our guard. We need to continue our good work. Um, and overall, I would, I would say that um, I, I support the uh, provincial recommendation that um, people should limit their close, unprotected contact uh, with people outside of their household, except if they want to bring in, uh, for example, essential caregivers as part of their household group or if they live alone and they would like to join another small household. Um, those are the, the, the household groups are the, the groups that we don't need to, um, you know, physically distance or practice um, wearing our, or, or wear masks with, but uh, we need to physically distance and wear masks with everyone else. And this includes uh, people at family gatherings or uh, while visiting friends. Um, so, you know, um, overall, I um, just uh, want to pass the message that um, let's continue to do our good work. Um, also, uh, this afternoon, the province uh, released um, uh, a number of additional measures um, uh, for the, you know, across the province, as well as in particular for three uh, areas of the province, 
Toronto, Ottawa, and Peel. So some further restrictions uh, to some business settings in those areas. Um, so um, there have already been questions raised about um, whether, you know, uh, what would public health here say about those restrictions. So um, I think, uh, you know, the thing I, I want to let everyone know is uh, the team and I are in the process of reviewing and assessing the newly announced restrictions for Toronto, Ottawa, Peel, and other measures that were announced by the province. Uh, we're reviewing that carefully. And uh, I, I think in terms of uh, options for the region, we need to continually assess the options and all the options, keep them opened. But there's um, two, two key uh, principles that we also uh, want to uh, follow. One is we want to keep schools and businesses opened where we can. And two is that I support targeted restrictions as needed. Uh, so that, that was all for my comments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wong. Uh, Councillor Lorenz. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Through, through you to Dr. Wong. So 135,000 tests have been done in the region. Um, someone told me the other day they know a 70-year-old gentleman who has gone five times because he was told by the Premier that if you want a test, you can get a test. So how many of that 135,000 do you think are repeat or people just going because they're concerned that they may have something? Mm -hmm. I think right now there's many of those tests in the system. Uh, and that is why, you know, the, 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 the provincial lab system at this point cannot handle that volume of tests, which is why last week they restricted testing to only those people who need testing as opposed to ones that are getting it because they want to be reassured that they don't have it like that gentleman. So now, um, People are only able to get tested if, um, you know, they've been in close contact with a case, they've had an alert on their app, they're part of an outbreak, or they're symptomatic. So there are, um, there's a, a, a shorter list of criteria that they must meet in order to be able to be tested. Even for the, for the testing in the pharmacies, it's not anyone who wants a test. It's uh, people that were required to have a test. Uh, because, for example, they, they want to visit a loved one in a long-term care home and they're required to have that before they're required to have that before they visit. So um, it's uh, now focused uh, on those who need a test as opposed to everyone who wants one. So uh, earlier in the week, my granddaughter was sent home with a stomach ache and mm -hmm. her sister had to go home with her and they weren't allowed to go back to school until they were tested. Mm -hmm. So... The teacher issues the order for that? How how does that happen? I mean, do you have to get a hold of your family doctor and then the family doctor has to? How has the protocol changed or do you yeah. take that information to the testing center? I'm, I'm just a little confused and I think this has happened more than once. Uh, I know a couple of other uh, people have contacted me about their children having runny noses and the whole yeah. family gets home till everybody's tested. Yeah, so the... Um it's, it's provincial criteria. It's provincial. Um, it's a provincial set of symptoms that the school boards have to apply. Um, and that's recently changed. So uh, the afternoon of uh, yesterday, <laughs> the list was updated. So now, for example, if you only have a runny nose, uh, you don't have to get a test. Uh, you can return to school if it's been 24 hours since you're symptom-free. Um, but if you have two or more symptoms, um, you, among a list of symptoms, it's on the provincial tool, then you will have to uh, uh, go get a test. Or your family doctor will need to say that, you know, they don't think it's COVID and you can return to school. There's also another list of symptoms that if you have one of these, like fever or new and worsening cough, even if you just have one of those, you will need to not attend school, get an assessment by your family doctor or get a test. And uh, you'll only be able uh, to return, um, you know, after um, you, you've been cleared 
um, by the family doctor um, or the or the test. And so that's that's the new criteria. So it it uh, is not as broad as it was before. It doesn't include things like stomach ache or pink eye or just a runny nose. So that should uh, limit uh, the number of uh, students that um, uh, you know would need to uh, stop attending school to get an assessment or a test. Councillor Rex. Uh, yeah, I have one more question yep. if I could, Madam Chair. Yeah, mm -hmm. earlier this morning, Councillor Galloway, Verbanovic, and uh, Urban, myself, uh, went to the um, Catalyst Test Center for Grand River. We delivered some pretzels, Oktoberfest pretzels. But uh, talking to the staff there, they were saying that things have really um, started to become more regimental and a lot less hectic. You have to have an appointment to get there. And um, they limit how many people get tested every day. But what, what does that do when, when people say, their doctors say, you have to get tested? And you call for an appointment and they say, well, it's a, it's a week out or 10 days out. Or how, how are we resolving that? Because I know um, a friend of my daughter's, when she called, they have her daughter tested. They said October 14th would be the earliest time. Uh, so um, it probably would be the um, testing centers uh, that would best be able to answer that question. But what I can tell you is that uh, I'm, I'm in contact with the, you know, with the leadership of the testing centers. And uh, they are working hard to try to increase capacity um, to test, uh, to, to, to ensure that anyone who needs a test is tested. Uh, now, the province has also just announced this afternoon uh, that they will no longer be taking walk-up appointments or walk-in appointments. Uh, people need to um, make an appointment. Again, it's uh, to um, make sure that uh, you know, it, it's felt at the province that this will allow them to better control the volumes that are coming in and better ensure that people who need to be tested can be tested. Now, I'm now in, in, in terms of the the um, the capacity. Uh, yeah, so the testing centers um, they are working hard and trying to increase the capacity where they can um, for the people that need it for the people that meet the criteria. The pharmacies are also another venue that are now uh, fortunately in our region as well. And again, they're, they're also trying to accommodate uh, the people that meet the criteria. Um, that's, that's what, that's the general approach uh, that's being uh, taken by the testing centers. And I'm sorry, the, I do have one more question, Madam yep. Chair, and that Go is ahead. with the pharmacies. I, the province just announced that this week that three shoppers drug marts in the region would, would be doing testing. Do you know if there's going to be more announcements like that where they're going to broaden the testing? And also, how does all this fit in with flu clinics and flu shots and that whole season coming up um, over, over the next couple of months? I know we're urging everybody to get a flu shot, mm -hmm. and it's a completely different, a, a different game than, than being tested. So how are we, what is the plan to accommodate uh, people that want to get a flu shot? Uh, yeah, so thanks for the question. So, um, so the flu shot is uh, the flu shot or the influenza uh, immunization program in on Ontario. It's um, a lot of people play a role in that, and uh, public health has been given a role to distribute vaccine, and uh, you know to to try to make sure that we um, have um, uh, you know. Um, and uh, we, we are able to keep track of the numbers of the doses that are distributed um, and things. The major players in terms of, of uh, delivery of the vaccine are uh, the primary care practices and the pharmacies. And we have more and more pharmacies each year that uh, join the program. So that increases the accessibility of the flu shot for our residents. In the last years, when we had that expansion to pharmacies, that's been a really great addition. Um, you know, we've not had um, uh, issues with people wanting to have access, understanding that this year, more people may want to have access. Um, so we are also playing a role, albeit a smaller one, in that we are holding clinics for families with children that are under the age of five because pharmacies can't immunize those people. And if those people 
also don't have a family physician that they can go to and get immunized. So there will be a report uh, coming forward to the next committee cycle with an update on, you know, the overall picture for the flu campaign in our region and uh, the various roles of the, the players involved um, in, in trying to get that, uh, that uh, vaccine out. So um, we, the, some vaccine will start to be delivered to family doctors uh, next week for their high risk patients. Thank you very much, Dr. Wong. Okay, Councillor Galloway. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, question to Dr. Wong in regards to the face coverings. Um, so I understand uh, today the uh, province is announcing a uh, face covering or mask mandate uh, mm -hmm. after um, the, uh, many or most of the uh, municipalities in, in Ontario have done the heavy lifting um, and have put into place uh, bylaws, uh, not always uh, the same. Uh, and uh, in typical provincial fashion, now they're going to mandate um, face coverings. So um, I'm just wondering if you've had an opportunity to, um, and I know it's, it's, it's relatively new, uh, but an opportunity to um, determine what um, changes there will be in terms of face coverings uh, vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our, our bylaw versus um, uh, what they are, are going to mandate. There's been no further information besides what's been released in the, in the media release from the province. And, but it's definitely a question uh, that I'm uh, trying to get um, you know, answers to. And I suspect we we may not get answers for a few days. You know, we'll, we'll the details often in the, in the few days that follow an announcement, um, and so it'll be something that uh, I'll keep my eye on and um, uh, uh, work with our legal department to keep council informed as quickly as possible. Um, what uh, they have said, and trying to see if I can just get that really quickly uh, up on my screen here in terms of what they said. Um, One of the things that I'm particularly interested in is you look uh, that over, Dr. Wong, and maybe Ms. Arnold may also want to chime in, is we, we went to some length and we had a lot of discussion and debate in the community and amongst ourselves about uh, the enforcement piece that establishments would not necessarily have to enforce it, that it was going to be more or less on an honor system. And of course, we put into place certain exceptions as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm, I'm certainly interested, I'm sure the community is interested and the business community is interested in whether or not those particular elements will still be in force, whether or not will be allowed as in the region of Waterloo to adapt uh, to their particular framework, if it's just going to be a framework which we could adapt to or whether or not it's going to be quite standardized across the province and uh, will have to uh, deal with it in, in whatever fashion uh, they put it out. Uh, so, Councillor Galloway it. and Dr. Wong, I see uh, Ms. Arnold on. Ms. Arnold, do you have any comments about the enforcement piece? Uh, yeah, actually, just to say that I, I'm scanning my phone as we speak, just trying to see when the province is actually going to release the details. Um, so they, I do not see them as yet, but um, we would uh, hopefully see that um, later today, later tonight, or, or certainly ahead of a committee next uh, Tuesday, so um, that we would be in a position to uh, at the, hopefully at the latest update of the Board of Health um, on Tuesday. Thank you. Dr. Wong, do you want to jump in? Did you find your screen? Yeah, I, I found uh, the exact quote. So it's in all public indoor settings, such as businesses, facilities, and workplaces. So I'm very interested to see the details about workplaces, which are in the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Labor, uh, with exceptions, including corrections and developmental services. So that's all we know at this point, and we're eagerly awaiting the details, as uh, Ms. Arnold mentioned. Councillor Galloway, any further questions? Uh, no, I just think the, the community is going to be very interested in that. I thought I read earlier today that this goes into effect tomorrow. Um, so, um, oh. uh, um, and I could be wrong on that, but um, um, so what does that all mean? And, and uh, 
how do we respond to that or do we have to enforce it? Uh, is it, you know, there's, there's going to be just a whole bunch of questions. I'm sure that the, the public are going to have and certainly the business community is going to have. Ms. Arnold looked like she had some answers, so we'll go to her. Well, no, I, I actually saw that as well uh, as of midnight tonight. But, um, um, you know, for now, it's the status quo in terms of the bylaw. It's not to say that the region's bylaw uh, can't coexist with this order. So until such time as we actually see the provincial order and get a chance to compare how, um, you know, the operational consistency might work, um, you know, people should... Uh, be aware that the regional bylaw is in force and effect and uh, should be uh, obeyed. Councillor Galloway, any further questions? Well, I just want to say that I'm actually happy that the province is doing this. It would have been better uh, a few months back when we asked them to do it. Um, but uh, something consistent across the whole province, I think, is, 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 is better. Uh, but there are, are going to be some operational issues that we're no doubt uh, our public health department is going to have to deal with. Okay. Um, uh, Councillor Vervanovich. Thanks, uh, Chair uh, Redman and uh, Dr. Wong. Thanks uh, for your for your update and all the, the great work that you're doing. Um, just following up on the the issue, I think it was Councillor Rents that started talking about, and, and you did as well, the backlog of, of mm -hmm. testing. Um, and I do know that Grand River Hospital has uh, mm -hmm. purchased uh, equipment and put in, a, I guess, a, a lab that mm -hmm. uh, can process some of those tests. Um, do we have enough capacity within the region to sort of self-process now so that we don't need to send anything out? And if we don't, is there is that something we should be looking at? I mean, is, is it something we should be partnering either with the hospitals or with uh, you know, Ontario Health West or and the hospitals or whoever to to try to become more self Dr. Wong? It's probably not a question I should answer just because I I don't have the 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 you know the the, the knowledge that the, the, the Grand River Hospital would have about its its uh, in-house testing except to I, I just wanted to, to, to say that the fact that they have in-house testing helps us. Uh, because it means at least there's a, 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 a significant amount of our tests that can be done here, which will, you know, will will, will help if there's um, delays um, across the lab network, and that they have been scaling up, and that they have invested in the, in the in-house testing. Um, they did that uh, months ago in anticipation of the potential need. Um, I think right now. Um, you know, in the immediate term, there, there, there might not be anything additional that can that can be done, except, of course, you know, um, if we have, um, if we have, for example, we know we have a very urgent situation we're, we're, that we're aware of, which is not always the case, uh, um, you know, and we need we need the results from a public health perspective quickly. Um, you know, there's, uh, there's, we, we know that there's this, this in-house capacity that, uh, that at Grand River that might, but, but I would say that, um, um, you know, there, there are like the, the testing is a, is a separate system from, from, um, from public health. So we're not aware really of all that goes into the system. And, and a lot of times what happens is they just, they just go into the system. So for example, if a, if a home is testing their staff. It just it just goes into the system, right? And then um, the 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 the, the um, objective of the overall lab system is really to get the sample tested as quickly as possible. And sometimes they will reroute samples for that purpose. And so it's a very intricate system. And um, you know, um, uh, I know that there. Uh, the last thing I would say is I know the province announced today that they're putting in additional measures, try to increase the capacity of the provincial lab system to process even faster. Okay, well, that's that's certainly good to, good to hear. Um, the other question I have is, I mean, we've got um, Thanksgiving coming up. Um, and so, um, I mean, you've touched a little bit on sort of gatherings, and but I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about that. And then the second piece is, um, and no doubt we'll talk about it on Monday, but, um, Halloween is coming up as well, and you've given some 
reference to it. But have we heard any more of the province is going to take a province, provide some province-wide guidance on that uh, to, to help us out in, in dealing with that? Yeah, the province actually is supposed to be releasing soon uh, guidance for Halloween, for Thanksgiving, for Christmas, for all the festivities until the end of the year. It hasn't come out yet. Um, and so, uh, you know, for now, I've offered advice with respect to uh, Thanksgiving. And it really is around, again, the same principle of trying to keep the number of people that um, you're in close contact with as small as you can. I think that's probably the most important uh, message at this time. Uh, and, um, you know, for, uh, uh, for Halloween, uh, you know, it's, 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 it's still the, um, um, it, it, whatever we recommend for Halloween should really align with what is the current recommendations for the community overall in terms of social distancing, in terms of not having, you know, parties where there's a lot of people. And um, so, um, you know, we are awaiting more specific guidance uh, from the province around that. But I think, you know, for planning purposes, people should make plans to have celebrations that don't involve contact with a lot of other people. Uh, unless, of course, you know, there's, uh, uh, you know, really good physical distancing and masking. Um, and, um, you know, apply those, uh, those, those principles that we've been talking about um, to their celebrations to keep it uh, with a small group of people. Right, okay, great, thank you very much. Dr. Wong, I see no other questions and I, I'd like to circle back to sort of the line of questioning that Councillor Lorenz was on and because I don't think people understand particularly clearly, we have 25 public health nurses in the health system and clearly with um, about 12 schools per nurse, um, we recognize that it, it, you know, they have a, a limited role. Um, can you just clarify um, the decisions that are made in the classroom are made um, under the guidance of um, the province um, it's public health guidance, and it's the schools that are actually implementing and directing parents about whether or not to um, take their child home or accept them for before and after school and during school. Yeah, at the at the school on the ground level at the schools, the, the schools will be you know providing advice and guidance to parents, but the, the advice and guidance is based on the provincial. Uh, Ministry of Education guidance, which they put together in consultation with the Ministry of Health provincially. So um, it is, um, you know, the over, I, get, I guess that maybe a way to explain it is the overarching principles and guidance are provided by the Ministry uh, of Education and the school boards have to follow that. So for example, the screening tool, that's a provincial tool. What symptom is in, what symptom is out? When, if you have this symptom, what does it mean? Do you go see your doctor or can you come back to school? That's a provincial protocol and the schools will follow that. Now, when we have a case uh, or we have maybe uh, an outbreak, um, that's when public health you know, will, uh, confirm with the school board yes you have a case yes this is what we're going to do as per, per as per provincial guidance we are going to for example dismiss the class um, and um, or um, you know this is an outbreak yes as per provincial guidance this is what we're going to do in the, in the in the case of an outbreak so it will be applying public health will be applying those provincial guidelines to the local situation and also uh, making those local risk assessments based on the actual situation. Um, so there could, you know, there could be some adjustments made uh, due to, you know, information that we get in the course of our investigation. But by and large, it follows the provincial guidance and the nurses will be helping schools to interpret and apply that guidance appropriately. 
Thank you, Dr. Wong. I see Charlene Sedwick Walsh is has appeared. Charlene, do you want to add to the uh, answer that Dr. Wong just provided? Uh, thank you, um, Madam Chair. I think Dr. Wong has given a really thorough uh, response. Uh, I think the key piece in supporting the schools is um, helping them interpret and implement the guidance that they receive. Uh, and our, some of what we've been doing is just helping decision trees so that when it goes from a superintendent to an administrator, uh, it's an easier decision for them to make because it's mapped out for them. And that's a large part of the role the nurses are providing as well. Um, it's just to help facilitate that decision making because it's, um, it's a lot on their plate that they're not normally um, involved with. And so we're just trying to help ensure that the right decisions get made at the right time. Thank you very much. And uh Charlene and Dr. Wong, please extend our um, heartfelt thanks to uh, your team. You've been working full out, and I know you will continue to um, safeguard um, the health of our community. It's much appreciated, and I know that you work very closely with uh, Lee Faircloth from um, St. Mary's, as, as well as um, Sharon, Dr. Sharon Bell in Cambridge. So thank you for continuing to be a formidable triumvirate for us on behalf of uh, public health. Uh, I see no other questions or comments, so um, I would entertain a motion to adjourn this Board of Health meeting. It's moved by Councillor Clark, seconded by Councillor Rents. Um, could you please use your icons if you're voting remotely and or participate, participating remotely and raise your hand in the chamber. That is carried. Thank you, colleagues. Um, everybody have, have a safe and good weekend. Thank you for this. Same to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.